We are really, really happy to welcome Jason Miles onto the show. He's the host of This Is Revolution and the singer and guitar player for Bitter Lake. He has a longer CV that I hope he gets into about his musical development. We're going to keep this like more conversational because mm -hmm. awesome. um, there are so many things to touch on. I mean, this is a huge topic. David and I have brought up some some things. I want to talk about the way technology is changing. Musicians, and that's access. very very near and dear to my heart because I, yeah. uh, I I didn't get a chance to really explain it to to Kale. I've talked to him a little bit about it, but over the last ten years or so, before the world shut down, um, I pretty much spent my life uh, traveling around the world, uh, playing probably about a hundred hundred fifty shows a year. Mm. and also working uh I, I used to work for contracted through a extremely large tech company so i worked mm -hmm. all the very large music festivals so uh david i'm sure you know a uh, stagecoach mm. mm -hmm. uh stagecoach coachella um edc so i music is literally my life and then i li i finally li moved out of there uh earlier this year uh, i lived inside of a music rehearsal uh recording studio in west oakland where if you're familiar with the movie sorry to bother you sorry to bother mm -hmm. you a lot of that was mm -hmm. filmed there everybody's video was filmed there it's not glamorous it wasn't like a hippie artist commune it was, <laughs> it was kind of a hood ass it's never game. as glamorous as you think <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and not every place is a drug den but <laughs> it was it was this one <laughs> it was. it's totally fine it's totally fine it so you know moved <laughs> I finally 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 it, it was it was a long time coming but uh you know it enabled me to meet a lot of people. I got to meet all my heroes, like through that place. That's actually how I know Boots Riley, mm -hmm. and, and so many other people. I'm I've, this shirt is not ironic. I'm a fan of the music, and all those guys practice there as well as. Oh, cool! Uh, you know, we had the platinum records on the wall of of like In Vogue and the Tonys, Tony, 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 and then I got to like you know meet them and know them. So that was pretty cool. Digital Underground. Mm -hmm. E forty too short. Um, name, like I said, name a genre of music, and somebody came Indeed. through there. So it it was from big acts like when the Cure came there to practice. And there's another funny Damn. story there about the Cure and Smash Mouth. If you guys care to hear it, uh, to everybody that wants to be a superstar coming through, uh, mm -hmm. we we deal with it all. So when I hear certain people talk about streaming and the money they get from streaming it always rubs me a certain way because for us very small artists we never really made money from the radio anyway mm -hmm. and a big reason why you're hearing so many extremely large artists talk about streaming is because they're not getting those radio checks like they used to mm -hmm. if you would have saw the size of some of those radio checks there's a reason why tours were so different in the 80s and the 90s yeah. and the 2000s, you start to see that cutoff because record sales uh, really drop off. Um, and again, being in that environment, you're literally with these cats <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that are having these conversations and, and you're, you're hearing about the changes that they have to make from their live setup to doing things like uh, meet and greets. Like mm -hmm. these artists are pretty much forced into doing meet and greets because everything is different, even down to the money they would get from endorsing instruments. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah, the model changed really drastically in a pretty, you know, um, condensed period of time. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's interesting because in some ways it's been good. I was reading that in 2017, the share of streaming revenue for indie artists was 47%. And it was much, much lower before that. So they're getting an increased share. A lot of things have been developed to try to, you know, give people control over their platform. I know Bandcamp allows um, musicians to sell their own music. I'm, I know somebody who developed yeah. that. Yeah. He was my my sister's friend. <laughs> um, and it's interesting because you can have these almost vulgar Marxist conversations about the means of production, mm -hmm. access to the means of production, mm -hmm. control of the means of production, while at the same time, these technological changes are actually replacing a lot of people. There, You may not need 
a, a type of backup singer if you can auto tune or yes. you may not need um, production models are changing. So mm -hmm. the tension is always part of the conversation, I think, with musicians. Yeah, yes and no. I'll say this. I'll say this. There is an odd shift to people wanting to be DJs and that goes into and this is yeah. just my opinion. I don't there's no solid data I have on this. That goes into <laughs> the amount of money you can make by yourself. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And for some people, so for example, let's say I hate to use real people's names. Let's say I'm Trent. Rez. You can change their oh, okay. Right. I, don't, I don't know him. Fuck him. I don't know him. He might be a nice guy. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he was like a nice guy. Uh, let's say I'm Trent Reznor. I can go DJ at a club, and just for the fact that I'm there pressing shuffle on my iTunes, you got to pay me six figures. Mm -hmm. I don't have the production costs I had before. I have to pay a crew and all that other stuff doing that all day long so that's why you see a lot of like bigger but was it paris hilton as a dj sure, you'd be surprised yeah. how much yeah. money these people make working yeah. festivals like edc which is the largest in northern uh, north america i think it's about one hundred seventy-five thousand people a day yeah for three days in the mm -hmm. desert and uh i wish i could have shared stuff with you so you could see the the, the pictures because some you know it takes me like an hour and a half to get to my office when i'm there <laughs> uh just to walk through the the it's a rave it's a huge rave <laughs> and you know when you go to like coachella and all these other music festivals i don't care what the genre of music is stages are spaced apart because you don't mm -hmm. want bleed i don't care it's all night it makes ridiculous amounts of money ridiculous that's my job mm. to do those reports so yeah. i see why there's a shift in that 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 for for a lot of people to want to be uh, DJs because it is a little bit easier and and like you said the technology has changed, but then when you see rappers, especially older ones, there tends to be a shift for them to actually want live musicians because they mm -hmm. need to change the show. They you know those old gray mares ain't what they used to be. They can't you know hop around on stage like they used to, right? So a live band takes up a lot of that space. It's a better show. But all that stuff costs money, and and this is like one of the things that's interesting, um, you know. And I have m much less experience with like actually like making music, you know, in any kind of professional setting uh, like that y'all do. Um, but I think one of the tensions when it comes to streaming and when it comes to these shifts is fundamentally questions about power and our relationships to technology. Like, what do I mean by that? Like, it's actually mm -hmm. not like like the fact that I can like on my phone pick up and listen to almost like any great musicians like whole catalog mm -hmm. is not necessarily a bad thing the problem is is that they're not getting the money right and the, like yeah. and then we get into this absurd situation where we're trying to talk about a problem of like power relations and capitalism right but we instead start focusing our energy and frustration on technology right well I'll, just, tell you, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you guys a true story about paul mccartney and i think i might have told this to you mr griscom so there was a festival a few years back called Desert Trip. You young people called it Old Cella. <laughs> <laughs> and it happens where Coachella is. And if you remember it, it was like the Rolling Stones, Paul McCartney, The Who, Damn. Roger Waters, Bob Dylan. First time all those guys ever shared a stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So Coachella is about 100, 125,000 people a day. This was in the 60s, like 60 some thousand people a day. That's a lot of people to see mm -hmm. six people, six bands, right? Two bands a night. Where Coachella is music from 11 a.m. to whenever it's over. This is music from like six to nine. Mm. And then it's done, right? <laughs> so, so to have those people there, con yeah. like, con shit all day, because you're locked in. It's a little city. Mm -hmm. but you're pretty much locked in, and it's a consumer paradise. I'm trying to set the set so you really understand mm -hmm. where, where all this stuff exists. So my job is to make sure the flow of capital doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. So I got to go check all the points of sale systems. I think we had about, about 900, about 900 points for one wow. music festival, right? Coachella has about 1400. Watch me get in all this trouble now that you get a message from Square. <laughs> yeah, they're going to so, be like, why are you trying <laughs> to? Have, I, you, you sue me. You're just practicing. I have no money. So, <laughs> so. 
I'm with this young kid that's assisting me in setting all this stuff up. We're just trying to make sure it's connected to the Wi-Fi. There's definitely several towers. They set up towers, so each section has its own freaking tower, right? Mm -hmm. We can't stop the flow of money. So as we're going around, Paul McCartney sound checking because we're we're at the bar by the main stage. And the kid I'm with goes, Is that Paul McCartney? I was like, I don't fucking know. Cause I'm like an old man. I don't care what the music I hear in the background. I'm just like, ah, let's get out of here. And it's hot. It's the desert. It's hot. And so the kid goes, I think that's Paul McCartney. My dad likes Paul McCartney. I'm going to go record it. I was like, I don't care. So the kid goes, mm -hmm. walks off, and he's recording Paul McCartney. All of a sudden, security, uh, we have all these like dune buggies or whatever. Yeah, I was going to say with their helicopters coming yeah. in. <laughs> <being> like, <laughs> the alarms are going the helicopters yeah. only for the rich people, right? They, they actually fly in. That's, that's not a joke. You hear helicopters like Thursday and Friday. That is real. But the, they come in with the dune buggies, right? Zoom. Put your camera down. And one of the higher ups from the company I work at you know, takes the kid aside, puts him in the, in the cart, takes him to me. He's got to erase his phone. They're like, mm -hmm. Paul McCartney doesn't allow anyone to record his sound check. It is $3,000 a song if you want to watch his sound check. Insane. Yeah, now, that's I don't know level. if Paul McCartney knows that somebody went out there to do that. We didn't hear Paul McCartney from the microphone say, hey, get that kid. Mm -hmm. He didn't motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure he has a team of people that are you know, keeping their eye on things. No musician also. The other thing that's interesting about music is like, we have this perception that um, it's kind of this authentic, intimate representation of an individual or a set of individuals, but it's always a team of people. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about having these conversations is that even when artists themselves are talking about these issues, they have to start talking about and acknowledging their team. So like Beyonce is, <laughs> Beyonce is like at least 50 people, you know? Yeah, you yeah. couldn't be Beyonce and not have that whole team of people. That doesn't detract from what she does, but mm -hmm. the way that she's related to is as an individual and the tension between being like the product yourself and then producing a product with a team of people and then negotiating around those terms and then operating in a power structure where let's face it, like capital has a tremendous amount of control. They can control your music for 35 years mm -hmm. um, or longer. Yeah. So it, it creates all of these like really, really kind of interesting points of entry for some broader philosophical questions around socialism. Before we get to more of those, I wanted to roll a clip that I pulled mm -hmm. that I actually found out about from, um, Micah Utrecht's article on Jacobin called um, The Welfare State They Were In. Hmm. And um, it's about the band Bell and Sebastian. And he talks about uh, a Pitchfork documentary called If You're Feeling Sinister, where the members of the band are talking about a Scottish welfare program that they participated called Beatbox that was specifically for unemployed musicians. So, Kale, hmm. could you roll that clip for me? I didn't actually move to Glasgow till I was in my 20s. I was unemployed just doing music for a long time and couldn't really afford it. Uh, and it was when I started doing a course called Beatbox for unemployed musicians in Glasgow. You got an extra £10 a week and that was enough to, to be able to rent a place. And that was where I met Stuart. He was on the course at the same time. Beatbox was like a course that they put people on when they were either unemployed or in my case, too sick to work. And um, they kind of gathered up all the, the waifs and strays from the town and, and they, they said, okay, you're on a music course now. But really we would just turn up and there wasn't really a course provided for us. We were just sitting around sort of like a refugee camp for unemployed musicians. At first I thought it was terrible. I thought the type of music that they were playing was terrible. But after a while I realised this was the only uh, game in town that I should use it. Maybe once a month your band were allowed to go in and record in the studio. And you could use other musicians for on the, on the course. And Stuart wasn't a bass player, but he said he would learn, you know, he said my songs were so simple that he would play bass. His style was quite well developed. 
I think I told him on that first day that it sounded a bit like blur, which I think probably offended him. <laughs> so <laughs> what I love about that is, you know, it's a different type of social welfare program than we're used to seeing, especially in America. Mm -hmm. It's about developing the arts, developing artists, specifically helping people who are ill or who are unemployed access um, the space and the resources and the money and time to mm -hmm. invest in music. Um, and I think that you can see this in, mu in moments in American music history. For instance, the book, Please Kill Me. It's about um, you know the development of the Stooges in post-industrial Detroit. The, despite the fact that you know, they're kind of commenting on this economic wasteland or extremely precarious world that people are going into as young people, it gives them the time and the space right? It's cheap rent is what mm -hmm. made New York music scene. So much of that um, has fostered music across the country. And I think that the socialist take could be to embrace some of that, to fund some of that, to make sure people have that space. So I wanted to see if you guys wanted to weigh in on that. Uh, David, would you like to go for yeah, a little yeah. bit? Yeah, and I mean, then we'll go to Miles. Or we'll go to Jason. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean it's 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 definitely it's definitely true. I mean, um, it's funny. Like the creative process, you have like two sides of the spectrum, right? Where it's like you get the social welfare programs, right, which is better because they're giving people money, and that is able to help them do the work. Or you have the other side, where it's like if rents are really cheap and you can get a bunch of people in a small yeah, exactly. space, then you have the opportunity. Or you, you know, can be and live in a warehouse or or something. Yeah, or like so. whatever kind of strange, you know, and, and incredible and, and and funny uh living situation that so many artists found themselves in. It was incredibly important um to to, to music. And it's something that I worry about um a lot. You know, like I'm I'm from Austin, I'm in Austin. Um it's a town that has a great music history. You know, history I was talking about earlier with like Willie Nelson had to come to to Austin really to become Willie Nelson because he couldn't make his music anywhere else. And a big part of that was one, yeah, there's a lot of people here making music together, but it was because it was cheap as hell, right? Yeah. And you could get by, and if you could play a song, um, you know, play a show every, you know, a week or, you know, on the weekend or something like that, you could have enough money to get food and whatever. You're not living a nice life, but you can get by. And that, you know, fed into so much of the creativity of, of the city. Now, to be a working musician in Austin, and I just mean like, you know, a regular person who's just playing music, it's just, you're, it's really, really difficult. And yeah. more and more a people. A lot of stuff shut down in Austin, though, too. I mean, there's been, yeah. there, there used to be so many clubs. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but oh, I, no. I did want to bring up the fact that you were talking about gentrification yeah. uh, the other night on, uh, on Left Reckoning. I was, I was trying to check some of that out. And uh, I kind of enjoy when you talk about Austin because I think my first time in Austin might have been like 2011, 2012 uh, playing mm. a show. It, it definitely wasn't a good show. I, Austin, I hated it at first. Actually, it reminded me of Texas of LA. I, was, I used to say like "f Austin" all. I used to hate it so much. <laughs> my hatred for Austin ran deep for a long time. But as I as I kept going there, um, I would see that the places that I played the the year before, sometimes even months before, had shut down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and even these historic places that have been there for for decades were shutting down because you had a new movement of uh, tech people coming in that didn't yeah. really care about the culture, right? They didn't care, then they don't, and and that's a huge problem. And then you also started to get this difficult part too, where um, because there was like you know people really don't want to pay for for music, um, it 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 started to become really difficult to be able to to book acts like i know some other texas musicians who have told me straight up like i'm just not going to go and play in austin because yeah. most of those places will either pay you like an extremely insulting amount of money or mm -hmm. basically say just do it for free the classic oh you'll get exposure because it's oh, yeah, you know yeah. the big city you know it's big on you know it's awesome yeah. i played case, a show in austin and it was for a tech billionaire Jesus Christ. For his birthday. <laughs> it wasn't me per se. I wasn't headlining it. I, I was just backup singing for it. And y yeah, it was, I think like the local police department was there doing security for him. You could see the divide. It was very, very clear, like what part of Austin he lived in and what yeah. part of Austin everybody else lived in. And yeah, and exactly. Like, that's a whole other thing we can get into, like Austin's gentrification and wealth divide. But like the, the you know the point here when it comes to music is like 
these things are social like goods, right? Like one of the mm -hmm. things that I love so much growing up was I would walk down the street, even as a kid, and you were just hearing music, right? Like that, my mom did not listen to yeah. music at all, right? So I didn't grow up in a musical household, um, but I was constantly hearing music. So I've, you know, I very much had that experience of, you know, being around music all the time. And it's not as much the case today. And that's because one, because there are shifts in like capitalism and, and culture and all that other stuff. But two, it's something that we could very much address if we were providing um, artists, not just musicians too, but artists in general yeah. with the funds or how like, I think it'd be great if the government gave people social programs to help them out. But if we just made sure that people were able to access a basic standard of living in their homes sure. and their communities, well, 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 things would be way better. <laughs> so, so our neighbors to the north in Canada, we have we have some friends uh, that we met on this last tour we did. The last tour I did was in 2019. Actually, the last show I played, uh, Big D was in. Oh, Boston. it was pre-COVID. It was pre-COVID. Everything pre -COVID got canceled. Show. Yeah, yeah. yeah, everything got canceled for COVID. But the last show I played was in Austin. But anyway, some friends of ours in Canada, they own a small venue in, in Toronto. We're coming into town and they said, Jason, can you hook us up a show? And I was like, I can I can try. But I, you know, they played more like it just wasn't. I play like punky metal shit. And they didn't mm -hmm. play punky shit and it's like all my friends are in punky metal shit bands or i know really mediocre young hip-hop guys i'm like i don't want to put you with mediocre young hip-hop guys <laughs> i want to get you guys a legit show but i can't just call in vogue up and be like hey y'all playing the cow palace uh -huh. so i i was like we'll do a show because also where where i lived there was a stage room um i should have sent kale a link to the place i could have showed you so the stage room was actually built to be a club Mm. Mm -hmm. but it's just where you can do practice before a show definitely like i said yeah. a bunch of videos are shot there so i was like we'll throw a show at this in the stage room and we'll do an old school house show style mm -hmm. and i had invited a friend of mine as a comedian that opens for Chappelle, and it was dope you know live band it was dope and i went to give them money at the end of the night and they were like we're fine we get a stipend from the government to go on tour <laughs> thousands yeah <laughs> to go That's on amazing. tour yeah yeah. And well, Toronto's an expensive city us. too. It's yeah. Toronto's not immune from some of these things, but you see how these, you know, basic programs and access completely mm -hmm. change stuff for people. Um, Jason, you said that you lived in a, you lived in this, in this kind of rehearsal space. Um, I wanted to ask you more about the, the way that, Musicians often share these things with each other. I There's this kind of unspoken. Bundle. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think like, you know, there, despite the kind of competitiveness in the industry, there's also this like really nice comradely favoritism that can happen sometimes too. So did you see this? Did you get, did you oh. let people in? So first of all, to get in the play, I just, not a lot of people live there. <laughs> <laughs> the owner has to okay you. And the owner is like an old school stoner that's only done this type of work his entire life. And he's mm. in his late 50s. And he has an oh well fuck it attitude that you have to admire. It's so rock and roll. You have to mm. admire it. When Digital Underground told him in the early 90s, you shouldn't do Tupac's album release party because there's going to be real killers there. And he's like, oh, no, fuck you, man. It's rock and roll. They have a party. <laughs> and it went off without a hitch. And that's been kind of his, you know, his, his MO. So there was always wild shit going on, like wild shit going on, like wild shit. <laughs> and you couldn't complain about it. Mm -hmm. yeah so yeah, yeah. i lived in a in a in a part where i was the only person that lived there but it and it was next to like his office so we called it like the hidden side you can't really see it from the street um but one of my neighbors who, who passed away not too long ago mm -hmm. uh liked to do crazy shit and at three o'clock in the morning turn everything up to 11 and yeah play for 20 minutes I can't go knock on his door and be like, turn that shit down. Cause I may want to record a, a, a song, but because of that sort of weird camaraderie in this odd space, what I was able to get was an amount of help that I never would have gotten had I not lived there. 
So one day we, my ex and I were in a, were in a group for about seven years and we were rehearsing one day and Dwayne Wiggins walked in from Tony, Tony, Tony. And he said, first he apologized. And then he, and we're like, Oh no, that's fine. Like we knew who he was. And uh, he goes, you guys are really interesting. And I think you need a video done. And we're like that. Yeah. We don't have any fucking money. And he goes, well, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll call my video guy. We're like, but you're Dwayne Wiggins. Your video guy is not my video guy. Come on. Not dude. anymore. Well, yeah. He takes us out for pizza. He calls up this guy. This white man shows up and he's like, So where are the people at? And he goes, These are the guys. And so he whispers something to the dude. And the dude looks at us. He goes, Well, how much can you afford? We're like, uh, $100. That's all we had. And he shot all day with us with steady cams and lights oh my God. and all kind of crazy shit. You can't get that anywhere else but that place. I got to know that my favorite band is one of my favorite bands is Faith No More. Mm -hmm. I got to know Faith No More pretty well. I remember our microphone broke while we were recording uh, an album and their bass player, Billy Gould, always said, if you need anything, ask me whatever you need. Ask me. So I go knock on the door. They're they're rehearsing to go on a tour to Japan and I'm knocking on the door and he's like, yeah, what's up? I was like, "Uh, our microphone broke. And he goes into the booth and he screws it off. He's like. Here you go. We're going to Japan. Just, just keep it. Give it back to me. You see me again. <laughs> like that. That level of of, yeah. of support. Uh, I I could only get there. And then also, like I said, getting to know all of your your heroes and having them support you, do shows with you, give you tips, give you gear. I have mm -hmm. so much gear from these people. Uh, yeah, there's tons of yeah. like interpersonal solidarity and, you know, um, assistance and stuff, I think, with musicians. And I want to see it channeled into <laughs> a union. Mm. I want to see, I want to like, you know, uh, help Anita Baker beyond just not streaming her music, but like, <laughs> you know, I pick it for her. I mm. would lay, I would lay down my time for Anita Baker. <laughs> but, but it's but it is interesting, right? Because as of, of course, I, I want to see something more fair, but there's definitely tears of these artists, and it's interesting when you see people trying to come up and all the things that they have to do. Teray and I talk about this all the time when we talk about like why black kids don't play rock music or even play funk mm. music really anymore. And first of all, it's access to instruments. Yeah, I was about mm -hmm. to ask you about that, like, because you know I play only acoustic instruments primarily, and I, I was like, man, that's expensive. Every time I think about like jumping into electric guitar, I'm like, okay, this is like three thousand dollars that I don't have, so I'm just gonna you know keep playing old school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you know, in New electric? Orleans, New Orleans just destroyed its public school system like more thoroughly than any other place, but they could not take instruments away from those kids. If you are a kid mm -hmm. in New Orleans, you get a free instrument. You can walk around New Orleans. That's where my husband's family is from. And a lot of them work in the music industry. And there's just little kids out, right? Like playing the trumpet, playing mm -hmm. the tuba. You, It's a city of music. It's infused with it. Part of it is because you know, well, it, for a while it was relatively cheap, right? For musicians to get spaces there, but they pour a lot into that industry. Mm -hmm. They pour a lot into those venues. It's, it's also in the they culture. Did, yeah, exactly. Cause like, that's a third rail. You cannot take that <laughs> access away from those kids. We I, need yeah. more of that. Uh, a, a commenter asked us a question about um, a push to revive the federal arts program, which was a New mm -hmm. Deal program running mm -hmm. from 1935 to 1943 mm -hmm. to fund the visual arts in the United States. I think it should just be expanded. I think we've kind of touched on this a little bit. What do you guys think of that? Jason, would you like to, to oh, weigh in here? Oh, man, that, that, that reminds me, again, of, of, of Canada with these grants that people mm -hmm. get and the funding that people get to go do their, go do their thing. Uh, that program was also, there were weren't they doing things like they were getting hired to do certain things? It wasn't just like, mm -hmm. okay, go commission. Go make for, your, yeah, yeah. Jason, go make weird, arty, loud shit in a, yeah. Like it. Yeah. They didn't just give you the keys to a studio. Like me, but, oh, I would definitely love to see something like that. Even in new Orleans, artists get housing. You can get mm -hmm. housing if you qualify. If you yeah. And there's money. artists housing in uh, New York city and some other cities in, in the U S and we, you know, we don't, we don't fund the arts because we don't really respect 
music. Like how many school programs have cut their or schools have cut their music programs? When you watch an old documentary about like a funk band, and I definitely got to meet a lot of the old funk bands, a lot of that shit happened in the Bay Area. Those guys all met in like junior high and high school playing in a band. Mm. Yeah. In a school band. I, 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 no, I think that's like such a, a good point. It's like one, like obviously most people listening to this know that us all, you know, as socialists are going to say we want the government to be supporting artists, right? And putting that money into, into schools, um, you know, and, and things of that nature. Um, but it's also something that's is worth noting. It's like socialism is about community and, and, and being social. And what we've seen with music, I don't have some like big theory about it, but it's just something that I think about a lot um, is how, music has become very, very individual, like as an yeah. experience, you listen alone, you, know, you might go to a concert, but you have your group of people who like your type of music. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and instead of it being something that was, you know, an, a community experience, right? Or like a regional experience. It, it's funny when you read, and uh, by the way, too, this isn't some kind of thing, it's like, you know, as much as I like it, like if you live in the South, you have to only listen to country music, right? No, literally, mm -hmm. like some of the great folks out there. I mean, um, I think about something like a jukebox, right? You come into yeah. a public space, right, to hear music and somebody's going to select it and they might be playing jazz or class or whatever, right? All different kinds of music. But it was something that was shared with a lot of different folks, which allowed people to in in like enjoy music as a community experience rather than just like, this is my identity. I dress this way. So I'm only yeah. going to listen to this kind of thing. Right. And I, I see this like with like our kind of like hyper individualistic culture in the U S in particular, um, you know, that it's something that's very harmful to like creativity and, and to community that we really have segmented things um, in, in that way. Yeah. It's the logic of commodities, right? Like, mm -hmm you have a bracketed product, you have a bracketed genre, you have a bracketed kind of self. The thing that's incredible about music, I'll never forget being in um, junior high school, high school, and I was in choir mm -hmm. and I tried out for a state choir. And you know, Maine is so boring, you guys, <laughs> where I grew up. <laughs> but I loved my music teacher. I will never mm -hmm. forget him to this day. I still go and visit him. I love him. Aww. It, it those people affect you so much those experiences do and i'll never forget being part of this like 150 person choir and you can feel the sound mm -hmm. and it's the same when you play in a funk band i played in a funk band for a long time when you're literally your body is vibrating your pulse is part of the instruments around you you're sharing the emotions of other people these things are mm -hmm. part of the the kind of socialist ideology the things mm -hmm. that underpin social democratic impulses the ability to create collectively the ability to have mm. force collectively it's why the workers choruses were so important it's why you know you strike fear into the slave owner and the um exploitative boss alike by marching together and singing the same mm. song it's mm -hmm. what protest is, you know? Mm -hmm. I think we've, we're missing a lot of that. And it's sad to me, while it's understandable to see these big celebrities pursuing these kind of individual remedies, um, you know, more or less successfully, it's sad that I think music, like as an act itself, it's almost onomatopoetic about the collective, right? And mm -hmm. you can't, um, you can't be a musician without a person to feel or hear you. You can't mm. be an artist without that. Like these things are really, really important to reclaim. And that, and that's kind of, I think what you guys were talking about with the changes in technology, right? Like I can record a record by myself, mm. Um, mm. which, which I did. <laughs> <And> <laughs> lockdown happened and fucking, mm -hmm. I was I was telling I don't remember who I was telling I was like the whole reason the podcast happened was because I had an idea on the tour in 2019 that I had had before that to do something while we weren't touring and I got laughed at by my band they're like that's dumb who the hell wants to hear a musician talk about anything <laughs> other than like drug stories I mean, <laughs> that's stories, kind of a <laughs> yeah you know? So I was like, no, 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 we're gonna do this thing, and it's gonna, it's gonna be like they're like, yeah, what you just you can do that, mm -hmm. and here I am. Uh, do you think? Do you guys think music is radicalizing? 
can it, can it be? be? Is it, it good be. for it to be? Look, Dead Kennedys, even some of the early metal shit radicalized me. I would have never known who Pol Pot was if it wasn't for Jello Biafra. <laughs> Right, <laughs> I would have never yeah. known a lot of shit if it wasn't for for Public Enemy. Uh, yeah. So yeah, there's a definitely a rat for me. It, it radicalized me, and it radicalized a lot of people. Uh, Joshua Con Russell, who who I think has has been on Jackman before, and and I know David, you know him. He actually lives around here. Uh, we talk about how punk and hardcore definitely radicalized us, mm. and and made us turn that hard that hard left um can it do it now the the thing about music now is it's just so freaking siloed mm -hmm. before you had mt yeah. whether you liked mtv or not that's that's how you got your music or the mm -hmm. radio or you got maybe, exposed yeah yeah now it's like if i want to listen to polk uh, polka funk <laughs> rap country and well, there's a guy that'll do it, and I'll have a Spotify station for it. And and I, I wanted to mention to it, and I want to get to the radical question as well. But just like on that, you know, it is interesting that we do have these catalogs, um, you know, of access to so much different kind of music. And even if you do like, you know, let's say on Spotify, like your Discover Weekly, or you go down any of these mm -hmm. these holes, it's all curated, and they mm -hmm. bring people to listen to the same kinds of music. I'm sure everybody has had that experience. Where you're like, man, I heard this awesome like jazz, you know, like African jazz song that's like so cool and like unique. And then you hear your friends playing it because they got this exact same suggestion. The algorithm. The algorithm. Well, oh, they got yeah. in trouble for some payola too for some of those uh, curated playlists on Spotify. So it goes back mm -hmm. to how do I get access? Like how, how does your album, like, I'm not joking. I recorded this record and I thought we were going to tour on it mm. and we're not going to tour on it because the world still isn't opened up. And so a good friend of mine who does the artwork for my show and artwork on a, a lot of other bigger records goes, I'm going to do the artwork for you for free. And I want you to release this record. Mm. I was like, I don't know how to release a record. And I, it's to me, it's like a fart in the wind. <laughs> like who's who's really gonna care? Like I'm gonna I'm gonna put it out like mm -hmm. in May or whatever. But it's like, yeah, I, I can't I, I can't mean, go out and and the connection that people are gonna have to it isn't gonna be the same. Yeah. Then if yeah. you we went to the show and and like experienced it, right? Yeah, it's the same with you know all of these venues that are suffering from COVID, and you know this was happening before for yeah. independently owned venues because of gentrification. Um, and, you know, private real estate kind of buying up and replanning neighborhoods. And consolidation from the very large uh, yeah. uh, production companies, you know, AEG, um, Golden Voice, you might know them as Golden Voice, the people that do Coachella, they were buying a lot of the smaller venues because they wanted to control the artists from the 200 seat room to the 1500 seat room to the to the 5000 seater. And then by the time Coachella gets there, then they're not going to ask for $5 million because you were overpaying mm -hmm. them rooms mm -hmm. um and also it's a way for you to control independent music Everything. for the most part. Yeah. yeah you know monopolies are are really <laughs> really great it's a real thing <laughs> for, and as we're you know and for certain a, companies and in a place as storied as the bay area with these music venues that have been around for decades that have just hosted so many great artists that you see have to shut their doors be it through the covid lockdown or just like you said, through just basic gentrification, there was a great like divey metal spot we had in San Francisco, which is like the only cool divey metal spot left in San Francisco. And now it's apartments. Yeah. Yeah. And I know David sees that in Austin everywhere. Oh. I'm sure walking down the street is not the same as it was 10 years <laughs> ago. It. No, man. I mean, I was laughing. Uh, I've been showing fam um, my girlfriend's family around Austin. And I was pointing some places that are like once like now a sweet green, like that upscale. Oh, uh, yeah. oh yeah. I was like, I was like, yeah, that used to be a gun store when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that you have to have the, the community protect. And like in a social society, that would be something that we would just want to have places to listen to music in your community. Um, I think like music can definitely radicalize folks. It can introduce you to new ideas. I mean, it, it has a radical potential because it can really open you up, um, not just like to other concepts, but like to other people. We have, you know, we all love mm -hmm. music here. Um, 
both as like a listener to be in a room with people. And sometimes like, you know, you'll go to a, a, a place and you'll see everybody. And it's like, man, everyone does not seem like we come from the same place, same walks of life. But then the music starts and everybody's feeling it. That's really incredible. I will say one of the most transcendent human moments, you know, that I've ever had is just jamming with a large group of people. And you're just like, it's, it's something you feel like is complete chaos. But then, oh, man, we're all able to speak this kind of language. It's like not even, you know, it's not words or anything like that. It's just like a pure, it's just something deep in our soul that we understand. Yeah. Sounds mean something important to all of us. Like those kind of like human experiences with our kind of politics, I think are quite radical. I like uh, music that can be political. Uh, don't get me wrong. Like I, I talk about, you know, talk about some of my favorite lyrics from, you know, old outlaw country records. I don't like it when bands are like too, like we're only doing, I think we talked about this, Jason. Like rage. Rage. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't, again, I'm not even saying anything about like rage or any band. Like this is not a general rule, but it's like some people, they do music, especially like socialists. And they're like, we're just going to like tell you the slogans of the things that you already believe. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah. you got to make, you got to make the music, man. No, it's like, you can do that. But like, if you bring me in with the music, then that's a, that's a good thing. Just you like know, extremely people send me country yeah. artists all the time <laughs> who are just like, we're progressive and we're going to yeah. like, just sing a song about you know progressive values it's like man i don't think this music is very good like i agree with you yeah yeah like, yeah, like that country music right and i don't find it to be very interesting just because it's country and you're talking about there's I'm some there's some, I'm, <laughs> i won't name any there's some people that definitely rub me the wrong way because i i bought into some of their slogans and then actually getting to know them it was just they found a market yeah yeah and it yeah. kind of blew me away that I was like, that's the mark. Well, I mean, you're getting paid. Like I'm here yeah. at these shows and there's motherfuckers here. But uh... <sighs> yeah, you know, I think the kind of political thrust, I also, I really hate the like overly didactic. Yeah. It's, it, it, it just comes off as a little bit stale and sometimes heartless, even though it's like very fervent in mm -hmm. maybe potentially naive, but in any case, other people love the the didactic stuff. I think the radical potential of music is what you were describing, David, and what you were describing, Jason, like the ability, I mean, this sounds corny, but it's the ability to connect people. Yeah. It's the ability to, like, you think of a city like New Orleans where people were absolutely gutted. It's very, very difficult to access public services there. They have a, a homelessness issue. The housing stock is unsafe for a lot of people there's extreme precarity but they will not let you take those instruments out of those kids hands that's <laughs> not that shouldn't be the ceiling but it's a mm -hmm. great floor to have to say all human beings have the right to creative expression and all human beings have the right to investment in that and resources for that that i think is is the the real radical lesson that we can take with music and and so I've worked in the, in the Gulf of Mexico for a little bit and uh, off the coast of Louisiana. And what blew me away was the fact that music was so entrenched in the culture. So being around young kids that are playing like washboards and shit like that, and they care about um, Cajun music. Mm -hmm. Which learning cool. to play the before, before. Say again. It's cool. Cajun music is cool as hell. Uh, it is. I, well, I stayed. I stayed at a hostel that ended up being a music venue. I didn't know it was a music venue until one day I went to go do my laundry. I was like, "What does it sound?" <laughs> Something I'm about you in your life. Oh, you only Blue. live in music venues. You're like, <laughs> I, <laughs> Ariella. This is a, if the world ever opens up and you want to come to California, I will show you and your family a very interesting life that I've led. David, that invite, of course, is open to you as well. Uh, but, but, but. It's, there's something about it being baked into the culture there that, that mm. kind of blew me away and made me fall in love, especially with Southern Louisiana. Mm. Um, it's it's so absent here that the amount of work that we're going to have to do to try to get this stuff back into the culture, because it is sad that these techno... I've been... My office is, is the office, so I get to be privy to certain conversations. And when you hear people like, look, these techno festivals is where we're making all this money mm -hmm. then that's the music that people are going to push mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how do we get instruments in the hands of of young people so they can be the next thing yeah i mean it's gonna it's gonna take on it's honestly just is going to take 
seriously political movements. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I love so much of what we've been able to do with like the Bernie Sanders campaign um, and, and the social movements of getting ideas. Like, you know, if you're working, you shouldn't be living in poverty. Actually, you know what? Everyone deserves healthcare, all these things, right? These bread and butter issues are great, you know, but you know, as the line goes, like we need our roses too, right? Like we also need to um, make a big part of our platform that, Hey, the socials aren't just, um, saying we want to make sure that everybody is like fed and house and all this stuff. That's great. But we actually have a very nice vision of society where we're going to be able to <laughs> listen to music and like go out and enjoy our lives. Like, we're not just saying we want to stop everything bad that's happening. We're also saying that we want to create a lot of good in the future too. Um, and I think exactly. that that's the, the connection we have to build. Yep. I think uh, Bhaskar always says socialists aren't coming to take your Kenny Loggins records. We're trying to give you more Logginses. Oh, yeah. Logginses for all. <laughs> <laughs> Bread and roses and Logginses for all. Oh, yeah. Um, Kenny Loggins I, has a song with Michael McDonald. I love Michael McDonald. I am. I genuinely, genuinely love <laughs> Michael McDonald. Hell yeah, man. You, you, I don't know if you know the young guy, Ariella uh, Thundercat. No. I'm old, so everybody's a young guy to me. <laughs> so you can imagine how I am at Coachella. Like, put put some clothes on, young lady. Your parents will be, what are you wearing? Uh, Kale knows who you're talking about. He just he just slid into the DMs to say oh, that. Okay. So he knows. Coachella one year with Kenny Loggins and Michael McDonald because he has a song with them. Yes, I will listen to that. If you could have seen the look on those kids' faces, I, I want to say that was the year Beyonce was there. Oh man! So there was just oh, it was a lot of people. I'll always, I'll always love Michael McDonald. Um, <laughs> listen to that yeah. song, Michael McDonald, Kenny Loggins, and Thundercat. It is I absolutely will. I think there's some promising things, right? Even when we're talking about the changes that technology has wrought for the industry, mm -hmm. what capitalism does is this kind of pseudo democratic bait and switch or pseudo meritocratic meritocratic bait and switch, right? So you get these stories of like Justin Bieber or Lil Nas X you know, kind of coming up through my, my poor dog is crying in the background. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> he, it's because he hates Bieber. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but you get these stories, Taylor Swift, even where it's like, they were a YouTube star, right? They learned this craft on their own. They presented themselves to the world and they were so good and everyone embraced them. And like, they're all very talented. So I am not saying that they weren't embraced from their talent. But what it does is the same kind of um, story that you get a lot in the US, the bootstrap mm -hmm. story, the I did it on my own story. Rather than saying we could create a system where things are shareable, resources are easily available, people have access, you can just like, I don't know, tap into a stream and see a band you've never seen before, go down the street to a new music venue and, or like, you know, coffee house mm -hmm. nights, talent shows, things like that. Um, what it does is it kind of tells you that the commodification of these forms and the increased commercialization and financialization are, are founded on this meritocratic impulse. Mm -hmm. It's just lifting these people naturally to the top. And that's why I think it's important when you see a person like Taylor Swift be like, People are selling my handwriting. Yeah. Right. And I have no control over who buys it. Well, let me, so let me ask you this. To that myth. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, Ariella. And I'm not saying this to try to start some sort of fight with you. How do you feel then about Metallica pushing back on Napster in the early years? Because that was their beef with Napster. People are selling our music. Somebody got demos of stuff that we don't, we're not ready to release yet. Yeah. And why are you? Because they're still. I forgot about now. Riots. Yeah. No. In the, I think in, in the in the eyes of a lot of people, you rich mfers. Yep. F yeah. you guys. Because people didn't understand that you know. So you you have a union like the Writers Guild or the Screen Actors Guild. People in those unions are millionaires, right? Mm -hmm. But they down to the per, down to the member say, I have good health care for my family because of the union. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not necessarily always about if a person is really wealthy. And l listen, if Taylor Swift, you know, managed this issue by saying, I'm going to start my own record company, my own streaming service, and then do the same things to every single person who uses that, that's a problem. 
But if you have an extremely wealthy person who has the platform and can join the right fight, that's good. We should well, be she end up getting a deal with with uh, she got Spotify. a Spotify deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She I mean, did. Look, Taylor what she said was meant to benefit other artists and so on. But the other thing is, like, it's really not about the individuals themselves, right? It's about their relationship to the power structure, their relationship to capital. So, you know, like Taylor Swift is fine. You know, she has several houses and she's extremely rich and successful. She's good. But solidarity is about risk sharing. Mm -hmm. Unionization is about risk sharing. It's not yeah. just about building power the risk that these individuals face is actually mitigated by them joining with people way down the rungs mm -hmm. and and it's in their self-interest to do that and that should be the point like beyond the kind of flowery language of solidarity which i'm into you know human beings are emotional and social i think we should like embrace this but beyond that it's like you have a self-interest in joining up with these people you are more powerful your interests will be more protected. If you have a person who spent the last 50 years fighting contract battles, you're gonna have a very different strategy than if you're you know, hiring an industry lawyer privately, right? Yeah. If you are saying, listen, all of us are worried about these streaming residuals, it is going to be a very different fight than one of you being worried about yep. it. And this is why I included Lauren Hill in my in my segment because she got trashed. She got trashed for like withdrawing from something that she really felt threatened by and didn't feel she had control over. And mm -hmm. it was at the height of her career. You know, she's still so influential. I mean, La but, Lauren Hill, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just gonna say part of the concerns mm -hmm. that, that she was raising are similar to you know the fight that Metallica was gesturing towards, the fight that now Taylor Swift has taken up. These artists are continually talking about the conditions in which they produce their music and the terms of those things. Mm -hmm. And to sensationalize the fight, you know, we'll sell papers or get clicks, but really, like as socialists, we should be thinking about the material foundations of those critiques. I think it it's. It's interesting because, again, you know, we can't stress it enough. A lot of these guys have been very quiet, had terrestrial radio stayed, streaming not taken over, and they would have been getting those large mm -hmm. seven figure checks, mm -hmm. especially people like like Taylor Swift. Um, yeah. Does it feel like she said all that to position herself to get a certain deal with Spotify? I don't know. I don't know her personally. I actually have a really good friend that I I. <laughs> used to engineer in Nashville. Uh, that did work on a couple of her records and has nothing but good things to say about her, which made me mad when he told That's me that. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, again, as, as a smaller independent artist streaming for me, like the goal for me would be to be on a curated playlist. Yeah, yeah for sure. You know, the goal for me would be to, to I used to have a PR person mm -hmm. that shit costed $750 a month. Mm hmm. To have someone that has a bigger name on their roster say, if you want to write about swans, then listen to this record from this asshole and please give us a review of this asshole. Mm -hmm. Please make it mildly favorable. Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of people get on. And also there's like a, a, a class component to a lot yes. of these people that we see big. I'm a huge fan of Guns N' Roses. Love the first record. Not too fond in the second one where he's dropping the end bombs. Anyway, <laughs> first that one. didn't know that Slash's mom was in and his dad were in Hollywood and the music industry. Mm -hmm. He knew. David I mean, Gaffney. Blue Ivy won a Grammy. It's like yeah, it's yeah. The, the nepotism is unbelievable. <laughs> but that goes into your thing about the story of people making it because when you hear yeah. about Guns N' Roses, you could Google Guns N' Roses right now and there's going to be some story about them living on Sunset Strip, mm -hmm. living off strippers, drugs, mm -hmm. booze, and the like. Yeah, You're not yeah. going to hear the story of Slash saying, I had a pretty idyllic life. Grew up in, in L.A. My mom was in Hollywood. My dad made album covers. And when I had a band, I invited David Geffen over to check out my demo. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. And I went to high school with, you know, the most influential people's kids and so on and so forth. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. But didn't he go to school with Lenny Kravitz? Like real, real talk. Yeah. Yeah. This is a light skinned power couple right there. 
<laughs> those are two of the most badass guitar player rock and roll mfers around and so it, it, it's what i'm saying is it's really hard when you really start to look at people's stories like who is really coming up that's why when david's talking about country music especially old country music because new country music <laughs> that just sounds like badass hip-hop <laughs> oh, dude, that stuff's a whole thing, by the way. The oh. snap track, it's oh. like one of the worst. I don't know, you know, it's just like, first of all, you know, like it's not a music that traditionally has like a beat like that. And it's really bad. It's like, you know, you're right. It's like 90, it's like bad 90s, like R&B, hip hop, but sung by like a super, like souped up bro from Georgia. Yeah. yeah. It's, and really, it's, sung by a dude. it's terrible. It's also that very doesn't like black me. people, but loves yeah. hip hop. Yeah. It's like written by a computer that was just fed like a certain demographics Twitter streams where it's like booze guns. <laughs> it's like, just it doesn't America. Seem like I, oh man, so there was like a really bad movement in like the mid two thousands, which was uh, to be fair, it was a very bad time. Just I think in culture in general in this country. Uh -huh. um, but they had this thing called like hip hop. Um, yeah, and it's on CMT all the time, and it was very goofy. But honestly, like that stuff at least has more soul than the snap track <laughs> stuff because at least it's just like some weird guy from like Virginia, and he's just like, I'm gonna, I like rap, but I also am a hick, so I'm gonna rap about you know, driving my truck around or whatever. Like, at least that's a little authentic versus these guys who feel like they're all like you know, they're all clones or something, they're created in the lab. Yeah, um, I feel like it's just a computer that's like, your name is like Jetty, yeah, <laughs> Jetty exactly. McGuffin, and you're gonna be. <laughs> Singing about how you like tractors. This woman left. You saw this hot woman at a bar. It's like they have to hit. Every and you're crying too. They're always it's crying. Junk food, it's junk food. It's junk food. It's junk food. But music like, just feed too, you is it's junk food. You're missing out on like all, all these great folks. Um, you know, just for people like there's a great YouTube channel called like Gems on VHS, and I don't know too much about the organization, but they basically do like very professional quality videos for like upcoming young country and folk artists. And it's legit, real deal, good music, but it's something you would never find Ooh. through Spotify or for anything like that, right? And like, you know, that's another thing about technology is it does allow like communities uh, to exist, but just like anything, new technology in, in capitalism, it just gets cannibalized and, you know, yeah. and that's what the radio was before. Yeah. You know, right. the radio is crazy too. Sorry not to go on, but like, you know, the radio, you know, we're talking about like old technology, like, you know, the radio had the same issue where the DJs had insane mm -hmm. amounts of power, right? They could, they, they would, and I know in like country music, especially like in the fifties and stuff, they would just straight up be like, I don't like this son of a bitch. Like I'm never going to play him on my station again, just because, you know, he heard something commie. about him at a party or yeah, was a was a more likely than anything. Um, yeah. You know, so these yeah. issues have always existed. It's just like, and that's why I, I've been trying to make sure it's like, let's not fall into the trap of, you know, blaming tools and make, you know, the point that we're talking about systems that use these tools in a certain way. And these tools get developed in a certain way to promote this one system. Oh man, like I said, I sat in my, in my room during uh, COVID lockdown uh, and recorded uh, an entire record and played a bunch of instruments at all hours of the night. And definitely used computerized drums on a lot of that shit. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to sit here and fucking bag it. Um, oh, yeah. Fuck, you were saying about country that I wanted to chime in on. You have a country it. song to debut right now. I do not have a country <laughs> song because I will not destroy that genre like that. And well, I think the stage coach destroyed oh, me. Booze, guns, and bars. Hell oh, yeah. Man, I like that. Uh, I <laughs> Austin, dude, look, David, I know you're a Texan through and through, and you like UT. And for those of you that don't know, um, David and I, I'll say this, David, we okay. are sports fans. Yes, we are. And college Sorry, football, on, everybody, around, please you know, forgive us. We, we talk shit to each other on Twitter. And the fact that we can have these shit talk conversations on open Twitter and no one comment on it is rather funny. Yeah, no, I'm telling you, like, not to derail, but uh jason and i started to talk because i tweeted one day it's like every time i tweet like just anything remotely about football i'll lose like 20 followers on twitter <laughs> you know, because there's so many lefties who just like are so against like sports like in general beyond just like not yeah. liking them like getting mad at people for enjoying yeah. it <laughs> so we 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 definitely go back and forth look my first time in austin i remember setting up and i had my shit and we set up our shit and i turned my amp on and said turn it on everybody left I was like, man, fuck this town. And like the next time I went there, I wasn't cool enough. 
And I was like, double fuck this town. And then, <laughs> and then I went there a third time because I'm a glutton for punishment. And I started to meet some good people and they showed me that, hey, everything here doesn't suck. And we started making it a, 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 def, a definite tour stop city in Texas. I but I will that. say the shows were always better in uh, San Antonio. San Antonio is a cool town. San Antonio is a definitely a cool town. Um, it's gonna start some weird like San Antonio versus Austin. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Austin, in the comments. Oh, they! I I would love somebody that they can do what they're gonna do. It's it's um, it's. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no! Carry on. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I actually need to end the show. It's been ah! super fun talking to you, but I have to put my kids to bed. <laughs> oh, it's late where you are, huh? It's late where I am. Yeah. Oh. I'm not on I'm not on the Pacific Standard Time schedule. Okay. That means I have to go pick up mine. I have a two-year-old. Oh, you do? I have a three-year-old. I, they're yeah. they're yeah, very don't cute. Don't feel left out. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> You're, I'm not saying it. I'm not saying it because you need to have a kid, David. I look at me. I've way too old to be changing diapers <laughs> <laughs> i stopped changing diapers in the 90s and then i decided you know and then you just again. jumped back in do it again yeah why not <laughs> um i wanted to thank both of you i feel like i could keep talking about this forever mm. um David, thank you so much for guest hosting. Jason, thank you for a riveting conversation. I hope it continues. Everybody check out their respective podcasts. And Jason's, when's your, when you're, you're, you're going to drop your album in May? Uh, your sure. COVID album? Sure. I don't, I don't, I don't know, man. I was, I was sitting there. I was like, should I drop it in May when Ben Burgess drops his book and I could like piggyback on him? <laughs> Like, yeah, like Ben Burgess, you really won't like door. this. <laughs> <laughs> you can open for every book event he does <laughs> without telling him. <laughs> I look forward to the world opening back up so I can like see people like you guys in, in real life and for sure. Yeah, we'll do your venues that Jason has lived in tour of America. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, thanks again so much. I hope everybody enjoyed the show. If you did like and subscribe at Paul on Twitter, because I don't even know if we have a Twitter, do other things for us on social media, <laughs> like Facebook. I don't know. Follow us on Facebook. <laughs> I'm hopeless, you guys. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Kale's You're gonna, unplugged. That means it's Kale's going to text me life. after the show <laughs> and be like, no, why not. why um yeah thank you both again and uh we'll have you back on soon nice to meet you oh i want to get you on my show one of these saturdays yeah let's check in about it nobody can tell this is the first time i've announced that you guys are here for our jacobin show first i'm extremely pregnant right now <laughs> you can't wow. see that's why i have to write out everything i say because <laughs> pregnancy brain is real that's also why i look tired people in the comments um but i'd love to be on your show uh pending you know all the pregnancy symptoms i have i would it's really enjoy that mine runs in all the time and kicks the door Perfect. in and yeah it's very cute. yeah as long as you can cope with me having no breath support and Potentially forgetting things. Oh, I think we'll is it a good. big child? Are the other? Were the it other is. Ones yeah, the other ones. Yep. The big children. Yeah. yeah. You have multiple children. I do. Yeah, I have two kids. So oh. I knew what I was in for. I'm not too worried oh, about you're it. Going for the, you're going for the trifecta. My mom's side of the family is extremely tall. I didn't mm. get the tall side, but my oh. mom's side is like six. My mom's six feet tall, and my siblings are very tall. I'm small. I got the small side, the Richmond, the Richmond, Virginia jeans, which are all like around five, five at the tallest. So are your children, are they, are they? My little? children got the tall Swedish. So uh, you're, wow. Yeah. Grown my mom people. would always be like, I never was uncomfortable and I meditated through my labors. And I was like, you're about a foot bigger than me. Like Maybe Trump. that's why. Yeah. yeah. So now all of the people in the comments know 
my personal, my secret. I've been hiding it from the oh, head like down. Oh, like when Claire Huxtable was pregnant and it was just grocery. Yeah, exactly. I'm actually holding a huge purse like, filled <laughs> with flowers <laughs> and like a watermelon. Well, congratulations <laughs> on yeah. on your on your pregnancy, and I hope everything goes well, and your feet don't swell, and you're not Thank uncomfortable you. sleeping at night. And- the good thing is I get a, like a lot of feedback at this moment from this baby kicking at certain times <laughs> while you guys are oh. talking. <laughs> oh, word. There's the certain stuff like, like, like the Nola to- stuff. Loved it. Oh, he was good. Hey, well, that's, that's good. good over there. Loved the drug den comment. Loved the Chris Christopherson <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I have to tell David Grissom and this Chris Christopherson story off camera then. Okay, well, we'll let you go then. Um, But thank you again, uh, both of you, for being on the show. And we'll have you back on soon. And to the audience, good night.